Pediatrics Part 2. In this lecture, I'm going to briefly mention something that's very important, and that's the parents of the ill or injured children, and then we're going to discuss the pediatric assessment. As a paramedic instructor, one of my most important responsibilities is to trust that the paramedic students that I allow to become entry-level paramedics through their skill set that they've demonstrated in class is that they are going to be able to take care of children. Myself having three children, I need to know that if anything happened to one of my children and one of my paramedic students who are now paramedics shows up, that I can trust that they're going to take care of them to the best of their ability. As a parent, I can specifically speak to how important it is going to be for the paramedic to develop rapport and to gain my trust. This is very critical. The majority of children will have at least one caregiver present, meaning that you will be dealing with more than one patient. This is a very frightening time for the child, but it's very frightening for the adult or the caregiver, and there's going to be a lot of different types of emotions that they may be experiencing in this very stressful situation. They may react with anger, with fear, with anxiety. You've got to be the calm in the chaotic environment. Establishing the rapport is going to be a source of very important information and assistance. The children will look to their parents when they're frightened and often mimic their response and calming a parent may help the patient. You need to approach the caregivers in a calm, quiet, and professional manner and understand again that the caregiver or the parent, these are the ones that are with the child at all times. Enlist their help in caring for the child, explain what you're doing, provide honest reassurance and support, do not blame the parent, and make sure that you transport at least one caregiver with the child. Again, it's a different approach when it comes to children. Comfort an emotional parent, but remember that your first priority is the child. Don't let a distraught or aggressive parent interfere with your care because, again, your priority is the child. And if you must, then you may need to enlist the help of other family members or law enforcement if needed. But remember, again, when you're dealing with a sick or injured child, you will have a caregiver or a parent most likely on the scene. So moving on to the pediatric patient assessment. Your assessment, like your general approach, will differ somewhat with pediatric patients, and you're going to be needing to be flexible, and you are going to need to be able to adapt your assessment skills. You've got to have age-appropriate equipment. You cannot just adapt adult equipment for the pediatric patient. You've got to make sure that you have the right equipment because you can cause damage if you do not. Also, remember your age-appropriate vital signs, and I know that sometimes they're going to be kind of difficult to memorize. Make sure that you've got a, a access, you have access to some type of, of resource that will give you information on vital signs, drug dosages, things like that. One of the things that I like for my students to think about are practical ways that they can adapt their assessment skills for pediatric patients. And the, the possibilities are unlimited, but the main thing is you want to remain professional while keeping your priority focused on the child and doing what you got to do to get the assessment and the care the, the, the pediatric patient absolutely needs. On the way to the scene, you got to prepare for the pediatric scene size up. You got to think about the equipment that you're going to use, and you got to, to adapt your assessment. Remember, this is going to be one of the more stressful times. You get used to calls that involve adults. Pediatric calls are fewer and far between, and so you've still got to remain professional and you've got to remember your training. Collect information from dispatch, the age and sex of the child, location of the scene, the nature of illness, or the mechanism of injury. Make sure you still use your appropriate standard precautions because there's still different things that you may be exposed to even though it is a child. Resist the temptation to hastily approach the patient because you know the patient is, is a child. Remember, personal safety is still your priority. Note their positioning. Look for clues to help mechanism of injury or nature of illness. 
and when the child is unable to communicate or is unresponsive, assume a mechanism of injury was significant enough to cause head or neck injuries. And in this case, you're going to need to consider um, spinal immobilization and cervical precautions. Note any pills, medicine bottles, alcohol, or drug paraphernalia, or household chemicals that would suggest toxic exposure or possible ingestion, and be sure that you're continually observing the scene for changes. Other important assessments, look at the home, look at, look at the cleanliness, look at things that relate to how well the, the child is cared for. Uh, the appearance of other children in the family, the presence of medical devices, indications of substance abuse, not pediatric substance abuse as much, but indications of parental substance abuse, which runs a high potential for abuse to the child. Also determine whether additional resources are necessary. Remember your pediatric assessment triangle. Use this to form a general impression. This helps you form a from the doorway impression and distinguish between sick and not sick patients. It's a standardized approach with three elements, the appearance, the work of breathing, and circulation. It gives you a quick assessment which paints an accurate pic clinical picture of the cardiopulmonary status and the level of consciousness. This is going to be done prior to your ABCs. It does not require touching the patient. You can do everything through observing and it still helps establish urgency for treatment or transport. So we saw this slide earlier. These are just different legs of the pediatric assessment triangle and different uh, findings. Often the most important factor in determining the severity of illness, need for transport, and response to therapy is going to be the appearance. The appearance alone can reflect the adequacy of ventilation, oxygenation, brain perfusion, body homeostasis, and central nervous function. Remember this mnemonic, the tickles mnemonic. Tone, interactiveness, consolability, look or gaze, and speech or cry. So just things that you want to look for in tone is a child moving or resisting examination vigorously does the child have good muscle tone or is the child limp listless or flaccid interactiveness how alert is the child how readily does a person object or sound distract the child or draw the child's attention consolability can the child be consoled or comforted by the caregiver or by the pre-hospital professional or is the child's crying or agitation unrelieved by gentle reassurance Look or gaze. Does the child fix his or her gaze on a face, or is there a nobody home glassy-eyed stare? And then speech or cry. Is the child's cry strong and spontaneous, or weak, muffled, or hoarse? A child with a grossly abnormal appearance requires immediate life support interventions and transport. This is going to give you an idea of physiological abnormalities such as inadequate oxygenation or ventilation, inadequate brain perfusion, systemic abnormalities or metabolic derangements, or even acute or chronic brain injury. You're going to look at work of breathing. So when you see an increased work of breathing, this reflects an attempt to compensate for abnormalities in oxygenation and, and ventilation. Some things you want to look for, abnormal airway sounds such as snoring, muffled or hoarse speech, strider, grunting or wheezing, abnormal posturing such as a sniffing position, tripod position or the refusal to lie down, retractions, supraclavicular, intercostal or substernal retractions of the chest wall, or even head bobbing in infants. You want to look for flaring of the nares on inspiration as well. Also, listen in the lower airway. These are just some different positionings that you'll see. This kid here in the middle is in the tripod position. This kid right here has intercostal contractions, and this kid right here has substernal retractions. This child here is also in the sniffing position, and the child is trying to align the axes of the airway to improve patency and increase airflow. This often reflects a severe upper airway obstruction. Here are some examples of respiratory distress in children. Well, the first one is going to be croup with strider and retractions. Note the retractions.
Note the strider. This is audible sounds that you will hear before you even put a stethoscope on a child. Tracheal tugging. Here's head bobbing. Tracheal tugging again. This kid is having some severe retractions. Here's another example of distress. Do you know what's going on with this patient? You can see his breathing. See how fast it is? See what's going on with the ribs? Do you know what it is? My name is Dr. Carlo Ojed, board certified emergency physician with Dr. ER TV. Stay tuned to watch the rest of the video. So again, just several different types of examples. No, no, we can treat this here, and then if he doesn't improve, then we transfer him out. Hello there, Dr. Carlo Ojet. In this video, we're going to see um, a very clear example of respiratory stress. This patient had clear intercostal retractions, which is when the patient takes each breath, you can see the ribs coming out underneath the soft tissue, and this is just a superb example of uh, intercostal retraction, but he also had suprasternal retractions as well, which we'll see in the video. So this is what we call uh, suprasternal retractions. You see the the soft tissue becomes more prominent every time he breathes because it's pulling. This is what we call intercostal retraction every time he breathes. All right, you get the idea. Circulation determines the adequacy of cardiac output and core perfusion. Pallor, modeling, cyanosis, these are all signs of inadequate cardiac perfusion. When the cardiac output diminishes, the body shunts circulation from non-essential areas, and so these, this is where you're going to see the skin signs. Pallor is paleness. It may be the initial sign of poor circulation or the only visual sign of compensated shock. Modeling reflects vasomotor instability in the capillary, capillary beds demonstrated by patchy areas of vasoconstriction and vasodilation. And cyanosis is a late sign and it's a bluish discoloration of the skin and mucous membranes. It is the most extreme visual indicator of poor perfusion and poor oxygenation. In younger children or infants younger than two months, you may see acrocyanosis, blue hands or feet. This is distinct from cyanosis. This is a normal finding when a young infant is cold. True cyanosis is seen in the skin and mucous membranes. So you want to combine the three pieces of the pediatric assessment triangle to estimate the severity of illness and likely underlying pathologic cause. Abnormal appearance of poor circulation may indicate shock from a cardiovascular cause. And your transport decision. So obviously in any child that you deem is critical, you're going to want to load and go. 
you want to make sure that you get a good assessment and you are providing those life-saving interventions that need to be done, but you need to transport immediately. If stable, you can perform the entire patient assessment process on scene. Your hands-on primary survey. So if you see this picture here, you see that they're using a length-based resuscitation tape. So again, with children, you've got to adapt your treatment to their size. Your ABCs, you want to manage as you find them. Prioritize the sequence of life support interventions to reverse critical physiological abnormalities. Your ABC steps are the same as with adults, but with differences to related anatomy, physiology, and signs of distress. If you suspect external bleeding or cardiac arrest, then you'll take the CAB approach. Hemorrhage control or chest compressions would be the priority in this situation. Also assess your disability and exposure. Early in your assessment, estimate the child's weight. You want to use some type of reference, a pediatric length-based resuscitation tape or maybe a pediatric wheel. This provides medication doses and equipment sizes. It estimates the weight and height in pediatric patients weighing up to 75 pounds. And in order to use this, you would measure the child's length from the head to the heel with a tape, the red portion at the head. Note the weight in kilograms that corresponds to the measured length on the heel. If the child is longer than the tape, use adult equipment medication doses. From the tape, identify appropriate equipment sizes and medication doses. So with your hands-on primary survey, your ABCs, they're going to be essentially the same. Determine whether the airway is open, the patient has adequate chest rise with breathing. If there's potential obstruction, reposition the airway and suction is needed. The breathing component of the primary survey involves the following. Calculating the respiratory rate, auscultating breath sounds, which are going to be very important, and check pulse oximetry for oxygen saturation, but don't rely on pulse oximetry alone for a perfusion assessment. Healthy infants may show periodic breathing or variable respiratory rates with short periods of apnea, less than 20. Counting for only 10 to 15 seconds may give a falsely low respiratory rate. In this case, you'd want to count for the whole minute. You also need to be able to put in context what abnormal respiratory rates may tell you. A rapid respiratory rate may reflect high fever, anxiety, pain, or excitement. Normal rates may occur in a child who has been breathing rapidly with increased work of breathing and is becoming fatigued, so you definitely want to get a history and look at the presentation. And doing a serial assessment may be useful, and this just means you're going to look at trends. You're going to continually reassess their vital signs. When you auscultate, you want to listen for your extra breath sounds, such as crackles, wheezes, or ronchi. Remember, crackles, also known as rails, are wet like whales. Typically, with a child, you want to get a history, and it most likely will. And ronchi often indicate harsh breath sounds or sounds that may be transmitted from the upper airways. If you cannot determine whether the sounds are being generated in the lungs or upper airway, hold the stethoscope over the nose or the trachea and listen, and listen for adequacy of air movement. Diminished breath sounds may signal severe respiratory distress. Auscultation over the trachea may help distinguish strider from other sounds. Check pulse ox reading to determine oxygen saturation while the child breathes ambient air, so you want to get a room air pulse ox. Place the probe on a young child's finger, same as adult. Now, infants or young children may try to remove it, and you may want to use a transducer that's a tape or you may want to place it on the toe. Greater than 94% saturation while breathing room air is good oxygenation. Evaluate pulse oximetry reading in the context of the pediatric assessment triangle and primary survey. A child with a normal pulse ox reading may be expending increasing amounts of energy and increasing work of breathing to maintain oxygen saturation. And the primary survey would identify the respiratory distress and point to the need for immediate intervention despite the normal oxygen saturation levels. And then with circulation, again, integrate your information from your PAT. You should have already gotten a really good circulation assessment just by viewing the skin color, temperature, and condition. Also, you want to consider capillary refill, which is often a reliable indication of circulatory status in children. Disability. Use the AVPU, awake and alert, responsive to verbal stimulus, or responsive to pain, or unresponsive scale, or the pediatric Glasgow coma scale to assess the level of consciousness. You want to look at pupillary response, look at their motor activity. If they're old enough, uh, you want to look at their response to commands. And again, combine this information with a PAT to determine the neurologic status. And then exposure. Proper exposure is needed to complete the primary survey. At least partial, partially undress to assess the work of breathing and circulation, you want to be able to see the chest rise and fall. Perform a rapid exam of the entire body to look for unsuspected injuries and anatomic abnormalities. But you want to avoid heat loss and you also want to maintain the child's modesty. 
Transport immediately for trauma with a serious or significant mechanism of injury, any type of physiological abnormality, significant anatomic abnormality, or an unsafe scene. If you must, attempt vascular access en route, but this is definitely going to be a priority call as um, vascular access attempts in children that really don't need it at the time could cause the scene to become more chaotic. Remember that your caregiver is going to most likely be your most uh, valuable source of information in your history taken. If the pediatric patient is unstable, you want to do this en route, but you do need to get your information that will give you good keys to form a field impression. You should adapt your sample for pediatric. Elaborate on your chief complaint. Also ask about medications and previous illnesses. Attempt to take the child's blood pressure on the upper arm. Remember though you want to use language that is not concrete. I'm going to take your blood pressure. You may have to describe it in other ways. Attempts to take the child's blood pressure um, may be difficult due to lack of cooperation and the need for proper cuff size. Make sure the cuff has a width two-thirds the length of the upper arm or the thigh. Here's a uh, pretty neat formula that will uh, help you determine the lower acceptable limit in children ages 1 to 10 years. The minimal systolic blood pressure is going to be 70 plus 2 times the age in years. So a 2 year old should have a minimal systolic blood pressure of 74. Anything lower than this would indicate hypotension. But again remember the pediatric vital signs as they're shown here are going to be different than an adult. Assessment and recognition of a pediatric patient in pain is going to be very important. Management of pain and anxiety should be a routine part of field care no matter what the age of, of the patient is. Remember though, not every patient has to get pharmacological treatment. There are certain things that you could do such as repositioning and making them more calm. Discuss the child's pain with caregivers use pain scales with pictures. There's several different types of pain scales. This is just an example of the faces, the Wong Baker faces pain rating scale. The generic on a scale to 1 to 10, 10 being the worst pain is really not going to work well for pediatric patients. They're more visual and they're going to need to be able to tell you their pain levels in different ways. Inadequate treatment of pain though has many adverse effects on the child and the family. One of the big things is you just don't want your child or your patient to be miserable. You want them to be comfortable. It interferes with your ability to accurately assess physiological abnormalities and children who do not receive appropriate analgesia may be more likely to have exaggerated pain responses to painful procedures. Consider the developmental age when assessing for pain. Remain calm and provide quiet professional reassurance to parents and children and also use distraction techniques toys, stories, visual imagery, music, but at the end of the day, your responsibility is for your patient no matter what age and just because they're a child, you should not shy away from pain management. If need be, you can consider pharmacological methods. In some areas, you can consider things like acetaminophen, which often works pretty well for younger children. Um, in extreme cases of severe pain, opiates, benzodiazepines, nitrous oxide could be uh, considered as well, but you need to make sure you weigh the benefits and the risks of administration. Some of the risks include respiratory depression, bradycardia, hypoxemia, or hypotension. Other risks could be things like IV medications. They're the most effective, but establishing access is a painful procedure. Also, do not discount the possibility of child abuse when assessing a child. Increase your index of suspicion for abuse when there's conflicting information from the parents of caregivers, bruises, or other injuries inconsistent with the mechanism of injury described, injuries inconsistent with a child's age and developmental abilities. Observe and note the parents or caregivers interactions with the child. Do they appear to be appropriately concerned, angry, or indifferent? And does the child seem comforted by the presence of the caregiver or are they scared and shy away from them? And remember, you're going to continually reassess your patient throughout the scene and throughout the transport. As far as vital signs go, unstable conditions, you should do vital signs at least every five minutes and stable at least every 15 minutes. If you do any types of interventions, you always want to pre-assess and reassess the effectiveness of the interventions. This concludes the pediatric assessment portion of this lecture. If you have any questions, please email me, nickray at suscc.edu.